Dilcia says, good morning, beautiful people. She's looking at you, right? <laughs> That's awesome. We, we can do what now? <laughs> New cameras, okay. All right, very good. And if that door is letting in too much cold air, we can always kind of draw it a little bit. Is, are you all comfortable there? Okay, great. Let's open our Bibles back, uh, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter number 1. Let me just adjust that there. And the phrase that we have been focusing on for several weeks now, it's right at the end of verse 12. So if you look at uh, 1 Peter 1.12, it says, Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. You see that phrase right there, which things the angels desire to look into. So we've been especially focusing on that phrase right there for the last uh, several weeks now. Let's unite our hearts in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to gather together here in person at the local assembly and then by extension, uh, all those that have joined us online and for the purpose really of uh, studying your word, being edified by your word and allowing your word to remind us about eternal things. And by, by reminding us about those eternal things that uh, we are equipped and empowered and truly furnished to face the things that we, that we experience right here now in this life. And uh, we ask that as we continue to study about the things that the angels are desiring to look into, that we would appreciate, not just what, what that's all about, but that we would especially appreciate the fact that by the blood of Christ, by his work at the cross of Calvary many years ago, that you have given us eternal life as, as a free gift. We thank you in his precious and wonderful name. Amen. All right, a couple of things to keep in mind as we uh, go back up to 1 Peter chapter number 1 there. We were talking earlier this morning, some of us, about uh, the, a couple of statements here. If you look back at verse 10, uh, how many of y'all studied your Bible this week? Come on, raise your hand. Everybody, right? Good, good. Okay. Um, do you think that the prophets studied their own writings? Yeah, look at the... Look at uh, 1 Peter 1.10. It says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. The prophets searched their own writings. That tells you several things about the prophets. One is that they did not have the instant and immediate understanding of everything that they wrote. So that when they wrote, like when Daniel wrote the book of Daniel, he, you know, he wrote it down and studied. When Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah, Ezekiel wrote Ezekiel, things like that, they would study their own writings. Now, now why? Why do you think they studied their own writings? Any, any ideas there? Why do you study the Bible? To learn, to know, to trust, to be edified. They, they studied their own writings to, because they had a desire to know the God who gave them that information. Now, of course, the massive advantage that we have now and that, 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 human, that has existed in human history for about the last 2,000 years, the massive advantage that we have, you have the complete book. So we now are able to see things in the prophetic program that were prophesied by the prophets that they themselves wrote but didn't clearly see. And the reason we can see those things is that we have the whole, the whole scripture. So we can go, wow, this turns out that that actually was foreseen an event in the future. And that's really even what Peter is saying here about those prophets. They studied their own writings. 
they saw those two, as they say, mountain peaks of prophecy, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. His, we would say his first coming and in his second coming, we would say his, his ministry recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the ministry, for example, in the book of Revelation, things like that, his first coming and second coming. So they saw those major events, but they didn't necessarily see all the details that we now see and know because we have the whole story, as it were. If you're, if you're looking at mountain peaks in the distance, you can see the peaks, but you can't see what's in the valleys, as it were. And so as they looked across the scene of their prophetic scriptures, they could see major events, but the details would have to fulfilling the, becoming aware of the details would have to wait until they actually were in the valley between the two mountain peaks, if that makes any sense, okay? So you can see if you look at verse 12 now, the Holy Spirit through Peter is making it clear that he says, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves. Now the word themselves, who is that? That's the prophets. So as they studied their writings, it became clear to them, it was revealed to them that these things that you're writing about are for some future generation out there. It says, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto, now what's the next word there? Who would the us be? That's Peter and the audience he's writing to. Some of you all said the little flock. That's exactly right, the believing remnant. He says, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you. At the time Peter is writing First Peter, those things that the prophets wrote about, and it was revealed to them that there was going to be a future generation that would begin to see these things. Peter himself was experiencing that. And his audience, they were experiencing those things. They were right there in that prophetic time schedule. He says, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. What event is that? Pentecost. That's Pentecost. Who is the them that preached the gospel unto you? Twelve. That's the 12 apostles. You see how specific that is? So you can clearly, you can, without doubt, without question, without dispute, you can clearly place the timing of the writing of 1 Peter as, as after Pentecost, but still Pentecost was very, very fresh in their mind. So right around the time of Pentecost, way before Paul's written ministry. And then when he says, again, at verse 12, those things which, uh, which things the angels desire to look into. And we've tried to say it so many different ways. That that phrase there, the things that the angels desire to look into, just like Peter and the believing remnant at Pentecost would have been excited about, would have been anticipating. Let me, let me close the chart, and Ken will remind me to open it up at the end of the night, right? Just like there in early Acts, think about Peter and the little flock that had now come to understand that Christ was their Messiah. He's at the Father's right hand. He poured out the Holy Spirit, indicating that the prophetic time schedule was on track, moving to the next phase, as it were, right? So they would have been excited about, anticipating that they were going to go through that tribulation period, protected by the Word of God, the end of which would see Christ return. Would they have been excited about that? The angels were also equally excited about it. That's the point. When that verse says, the things which the angels desire to look into, they are desiring to see the resolution of the angelic conflict because they're going to participate in it. Remember that? L look, I, I, I think we looked at this verse at least once or twice already, but go with me to uh, Matthew 24. Go to Matthew 24. 
Notice, notice here, Matthew 24. The angels themselves are going to have direct participation in the resolution of the angelic conflict, all connected to and part of the return of the king. If you look at uh, Matthew 24, this is just going to be just one example of their anticipation, excitement about being involved in this. So Matthew 24, verse 29, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So there's the shake up of the satanic powers out of the heavens. You see right at the end of verse 29? There's the shake up of the, the satanic powers out of the heavens. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man, what? Coming. So not only, is, not only are they going to see the sign, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, but he's going to come to the earth. He's not going to stay there. He's going to come to the earth. And it goes on to say, uh, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now watch this. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. You see that there? The, the angels, are, are, they, they're going to have a direct involvement in the bringing to pass of all the prophecies regarding the right of the king, the Lord Jesus Christ, to reclaim the earth to himself and his nation, his people, his city, Jerusalem, all to himself. They're going to play a direct role in that, as, as a verse like that indicates, all right? That's just, um, okay, so when he says here, back over in 1 Peter, the things that the angels desire to look into, we have already talked a great deal about uh, uh, the angels. We, we've, we've looked a lot about the creation of the angels, when they were created, why they were created, their purpose, things like that. Fundamentally, what, what's the main purpose and intention uh, as far as how God is going to use the angels? Does anybody remember what it was? I remember? Look, look over to John chapter 1. Look over to John chapter number one. This goes back to a couple of weeks ago and we talked briefly about this. Look over to John chapter number one and you can see it in a passage like this. John chapter number one, verse 51. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open. Uh, John 1, 51. John 1, 51. It says, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now hold that verse and turn to Genesis 28. Hold that verse there and turn to Genesis 28. We're going to compare something. The verses are very, very similar, but there is something very distinct that is different. Look over to Genesis 28, but hold John chapter 1 there. Watch this there. In Genesis 28, this is when Jacob gets that vision of this ladder. Is, uh, this, this stairway to heaven, is that what that song was built on? No, maybe not. <laughs> okay. you know. So look at Genesis 28, and we're going to... Start at verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows uh, and lay down in that place to sleep. You see at verse 11 there? By the way, if, if you ever think you didn't get a very good night's sleep and your pillow was pretty hard, always remember that verse right there. <laughs> okay. So it says here, and he dreamed... And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and de descending upon it. You see the picture there? So he sees this vision of a ladder on the earth, 
Heaven is open. There's clearly a, an access point. There's a portal. And he sees the angels eight going up from the earth to heaven and back to the earth. So one of the main purposes, not the only purpose, but one of the main purposes for which God created the angelic race was to be the liaison to take information from the Lord who was going to rule on the earth to get, take that information into the heavens and administer the heavens and so forth, the liaison between heaven and earth. You'll notice at this verse 12, and he dreamed and began, and behold, a ladder set on where? The earth. the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Compare that now with the passage in John 151. John 151. <clears throat> John 1, chapter 51. Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the earth. Huh, it doesn't say it. it. See that? So when you take both passages together, you see the angels of God ascending and descending from the earth, but John says upon the Son of Man. So when this is going to be fulfilled, where is the Son of Man? He's on the earth. Isn't that cool? And so you, insight, passages like this give us tremendous insight as to one of the original purposes as to why God created the angelic race. And we've already looked at a lot of great detail about that. We also noted that in Scripture, clearly now there, you've got two massive angelic armies. One angelic army that is, is aligned with Satan, who is the devil, the old the old serpent, the dragon, and then of course you've got another massive army, the Lord and his angels. And which that brought us to the question, well, wait a minute, how did Satan get angels and how did Satan become Satan anyway? So we spent quite a bit of time already in the book of uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, looking at uh, who he was, what he was created to be. Um, I, again, I, I, every time I think about this and I study it, there's so much detail that just keeps coming to the surface. It's quite, it's just, it just kind of stops you in your tracks as you, as you think about what's going on. When, when God, Scripture says this uh, about, about uh, this, this creature. Go back with me, if you would, to Ezekiel 28 here. Ezekiel chapter number 28. Ezekiel chapter number 28. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter number 28. And then you're also going to want to get Psalms 96. Now just real quickly now because we've already been through much of this. Ezekiel 28 verse 12 Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. As we read through this, just, just think about this creature, how beautiful this creature was. He seals up the sum, perfect in wisdom and beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the asardius, the tobas, the diamond the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou art created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Who remembers what the word anointed means? That means chosen one, it means Christ. This, he was a Christ, the anointed. And God says, and I have set thee so. Thou hast... Uh, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And remember, he wasn't burned by them. He wasn't, he wasn't at all destroyed by the very holiness of Almighty God, which is what those stones of fire clearly are pictures of. The most beautiful creature ever created by God was this being right here. God exalted this particular creature above all the angels. He said, the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. God put him in that position. 
this creature was the most beautiful and the most highly exalted of all the creatures, I'm, I'm using that word on purpose, that God created. And God put on display what beauty looked like in this creature. If you were to ask God, God, what does beauty look like? God would have said, right there. Don't you say, you've heard the statement, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, right? What do we mean by that? Well, that it's somewhat subjective and that what is beautiful to this person, this person might think something else is beautiful. So that they have their, their if you were to ask God, God of all your creatures, are the heavens the most beautiful? God would say something, you know, the heavens are beautiful. And they even declare the glory of God. God, is the earth beautiful? Wow, the earth is beautiful. And it too declares the glory of God. But God, what to you? Where is, where is of, you, of all that you've created, what's the most beautiful? And he would have said, the anointed cherub that covereth. Look at him. Think about that. And of course it was, he was lifted up because of his beauty. What, what happened to this creature and hence the fall. Now, let me mention just a couple of other quick things right here from this passage and then we've got to get to Isaiah 14. I got a question for you. When it says at verse 12, the phrase about halfway through, thou sealest up the sum how did, how did this creature become that? How, how is it that he got that? He, there you go. What'd you say, Sue? What'd you say, Bob? He got that as a free gift. Look at the next phrase. Full of wisdom. How did he get that? As a free gift. Perfect in beauty. How did he get that? as a free gift. You look at how he's described all the precious stones. He didn't have to go to the local jewelry store and buy any of those stones. Every, every fiber of this person's, of this creature's being, his entire nature, everything was given to him by God as a free gift. And you know what he does? He goes and merchandises that which God gave him freely. That's what religion is. And it starts right there. What was given to this creature completely out of the generosity, the love, the creativity, the goodness, the grace of Almighty God, when he created this creature, this creature is lifted up because of his beauty and his pride and so forth, and then he goes and merchandises all that which he has, seeks to make a gain of it. He takes and merchandises that which God gave him freely. Watch him do it here. Verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. See, he had direct access to the God, right to the very presence of Almighty God. And he was not destroyed by the holiness of God, even though he was right there in his presence. Thou, thou hast walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. There was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. See, he immediately began to limit his access to some of those things, such as the stones of fire, but he did not immediately destroy Satan at that instant in time, as it were. And there's a reason for all that. Look at verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. His beauty was given to him by grace. So for his heart to be lifted up by his beauty, that's his pride. Look how beautiful I am. Everybody look at me. 
making himself worthy of praise, thinking so. It says, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. See how he, he let his beauty that was given to him by grace bring him to the place of pride. His, the wisdom that was given to him of God, he corrupts it by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy, what's it say there? What are sanctuaries? Remember, what are sanctuaries? Places to think, places to compose, places to write, places to pray, places to gather together and, and, and think of him as, as, the, as the orchestrator of the praise and worship of Almighty God among the angels. He had specific sanctuaries, plural by the way, more than one, places where he could go to allow the wisdom and creativity of God that God had input, had put in him to let that creativity come forth out of him where he could write, as it were, music to God, songs of praise and worship to God. And he defiles those places. He uses them for a different purpose, an unintended purpose, the purpose of spreading iniquity. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by, thy multi, by the multitude of thine iniquity, by the iniquity of thy traffic. And we saw the comparison last time, that the parallel on the earth with the prince of Tyrus, before he became the king of Tyrus, the prince of Tyrus, who was inspired and empowered by Satan himself, uses his wisdom, his creativity, his genius, his beauty, to get to himself riches, power, glory, honor, gold, silver, precious stones. That's the first part of Ezekiel 28. And so you see that what this creature did in heaven among the angels out there, he was mimicking that in the prince of Tyrus on the earth by the prince of Tyrus establishing using his wisdom and creativity and genius by establishing one of the most powerful, prominent, influential empires among the Gentiles on earth at that time in human history. Tyrus became, as it were, as it, be, as it were, the, the crowning kingdom. The kingdom that all the other kingdoms came to to be crowned by. Tyrus. It would come to Tyrus and interact with Tyrus, as it were, this kingdom, to receive glory and honor and praise. And Tyrus would crown them if they would submit. Huh. <laughs> you see the picture there? Now, of course, Tyrus gets destroyed, and then ultimately Babylon's going to wind up doing that same concept. Babylon is yet going to be the absolute greatest Gentile empire on planet Earth uh, prior to the coming of Christ. And that's, that's why you see Revelation 17 and in, in chapter 18 in particular, when all the merchants of the earth bewail the destruction of Babylon because that's where they have given their loyalty from, that's when they have created their wealth from, and they see it destroyed, okay? Now, so, we, so we've gone through all that. Now, here's what I need you to do. Let's go w over to Isaiah chapter number 14, and then you're also going to want to get... Uh, uh, Colossians chapter number one, Isaiah 14. That, that was most all that was review. Henry, go ahead. Yeah, no, before we go to Isaiah on Ezekiel 28 18, where it says, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries. Yes. The Bible obviously cannot make a mistake. So it says, Thy sanctuaries. So as you said, you know, God gave him all the beauty and the wisdom as a free gift by grace. Yes. And including the sanctuary. Including the sanctuary. Of the sanctuary. Yes, absolutely. That's what, yeah, what Henry mentioned there is when that verse says, thy sanctuaries, God gave him freely those dwelling places, those sanctuaries. And he, mer he went out and merchandised everything that God gave him as a free gift. By the way, I meant to do this one as well. Look over to Psalms 96, and then we're going to get to Isaiah uh, uh, 14. Let me make sure I got the right one. Yeah. Watch this. Look at Psalms 96 and then uh, and do hold, hold Ezekiel 28. 
And do you remember I asked the question in the light of, sorry that this is a little disjointed this morning, okay, but uh, remember I asked the question in the light of Ezekiel 28, when it says, Thou sealest up the sum of, uh, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Remember I asked that if we were to go and ask God, God, what's the most beautiful of all the creatures and of all creation? He would appoint it to this creature. But there is a beauty that far exceeds even this creature. Look at Psalms 96. Look at Psalms 96. And look at verse 9. Look at this. Psalms 96, verse 9 says, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of what? Holiness. Holiness. Fear before him all the earth. There is an absolute beauty that excels anything and everything that was ever created. God's holiness was never created. God has always been God. And he's the most beautiful thing that, it, that exists, and in the case of God has always existed, is the beauty of his holiness. Just, just to stop and think about that, if you've ever, uh, and so let's do it for a moment, let's just think about that. If you, if you were to ask people, especially people that love the outdoors and maybe like to go hiking and fishing, camping, whatever it might be, and like to travel, and you were to say something like that, what, what are some things just really beautiful that you've seen in, in your lifetime? Isn't it quite often that we'll, people will talk about maybe a beautiful sunset or beautiful mountain range or a beautiful river? It, that's pretty, pretty common, and rightfully so because the creation really does speak to the beauty of God. Others might say, wow, to be able to go out in an area where there's no light pollution at night and just to look up and the beauty of the stars. And that's just a teeny tiny speck, apparently, of the size of the heavens. That's also beautiful. Others might say, wow, I went up to Alaska, I went up to the north, and I never, ever, ever seen something as beautiful as what they call it, the Borealis effect. Is that is that what they call it? The, the aurora? Is that yeah, the aurora? And they say that that there's just nothing like it. It just is mesmerizing. Just uh, so you can see how different people certainly can recognize things. And we all would say, yeah, all those things are beautiful, right? By the way, have any of y'all seen the, the lights, the northern lights? And I've never seen them other than on YouTube. <laughs> you know, that doesn't quite cut it, does it? You know? But everybody here has seen. How many of y'all been to Colorado? Like, Denise, you go to Colorado or Montana a lot, right? And so the beautiful mountains and everything, the horses out there. How many of y'all go into the Rocky Mountains? It, it, it's just beautiful out there. But if you were to ask God, and, and God, God would say, yes, all those things are beautiful, and my very hand created all those things, which, wow, <laughs> that's pretty cool. So he, so he drew all those paintings, whatever, as it were. But he said, if you really want to know where beauty is, that verse says, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Wow, the perfection of who God is in and of himself. And so even though he created this creature who became, who was Lucifer, who became Satan, was perfect in beauty and so forth, there was even a beauty that far excelled that beauty. When Satan was puffed up by his own beauty, he took his eyes off the true beauty, the beauty of holiness. And as soon as he thought he could somehow equal or match or come to that level, Boom, that's when that iniquity manifested itself in his own heart. Now, go back with me, if you would, to uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. I'm sorry, Isaiah 14 and Colossians 1 here. So what we're going to do now, then, we want to look at some specifics as to... So, so his heart was lifted up because of his beauty and... and he was lifted up by pride. He was impressed with himself. What that led to was a specific plan 
by which he would present himself to be worthy of and equal to the Most High God. And it's this plan that he went out and merchandised among the angels when he invited the upper echelon of the angels into his sanctuaries, his dwellings as it were, and he presented this plan and how he was going to do this. Isaiah 14 is a key passage that lays out the, the plan. It, it's really amazing the insight that Scripture gives us here. So look at Isaiah 14. I do recognize that many of us have been through this before, so we can go through it maybe a little bit quickly, but we don't want to shortchange this in any way. Isaiah chapter 14 is what God through Isaiah prophesies that is going to be said in the future to this creature when he is finally completely overthrown. It's going to be said to him. If you look at the context here, um, I'm going to jump down to verse uh, 4. That thou shall take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How has the oppressor what? Ceased. ceased. The golden city ceased. What does it mean for something to cease? It's been brought to an end. You see two things there. The oppressor has ceased. Does that sound like a good thing or a bad thing? That's a wonderful thing. When it says, How has the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The golden city is going to be Babylon, prophetically. Babylon is going to be that ultimate manifestation and attempt by Satan to completely set up his millennial reign, his kingdom reign, as the anointed cherub, him being the false Christ. Babylon is going to be his attempt to set up his kingdom reign on planet Earth. It's going to be the most powerful, the mightiest empire on planet Earth among the Gentiles ever. It, it, by the way, it's still future. And this is a prophecy about its eventual destruction, and so its oppression is going to cease. Babylon's going to cease. And you can see the result of it. Look at verse 5. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. You see the wicked there? That's the Antichrist, and he's got rulers with him. That was verse 5. He who smote the people in, a, in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is what and what? And then what do they do? They break forth into singing. You see, are you getting the picture there? There's absolutely going to be a time on this planet when the oppressor is destroyed, when the rebellion is destroyed, the wicked Antichrist and his princes are going to be destroyed. They're all going to be brought to an end. And finally, the earth is going to rest. It's going to be quiet. And then break out into singing. You see the picture there? Isn't that cool, Rich? Go ahead. <laughs> Exactly. Rich, let me mention for the folks on the internet there that Rich mentioned that, well, there's clearly a parallel. You go back when, when God brought Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea, and then Pharaoh and his armies were destroyed in the sea, and then they sang that song. So you see the, pr the prophecy here, what's going on. And it's in this prophecy that God says, here's what's going to be said after the destruction of the wicked, the Antichrist, and the destruction of Satan, as it were, and his attempt to, claim, to, to, to maintain power over the earth, here's what's going to be said to him. Look at verse, jump ahead to verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Anybody know what the word, the name, the title Lucifer means? Like light bearer. Interesting, isn't it? Okay. How, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning. Now we've talked about that. Son of the morning. Huh. Son of the morning. There's a couple of ways you could think about that. Is one is that he actually was created, he was brought forth 
in the morning time. You think about when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in the Garden of Eden talks to Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve after the fall. It said they came, it says that they heard the, the word Lord coming in the cool of the day. That's the morning time, okay? So either this creature was, was created in the morning time and or he was created to be the son of the morning, the heir of the morning, the director of the morning. God in Job says to Job, hast thou commanded this, the morning since thy days? Well, evidently this one was supposed to command the morning, the rising of the sun, the rising of the sun to the glory of God. Think about all that, okay? But it says here, verse 12, art, art thou, uh, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did what? Weaken, Weaken the nations. Okay, let's, let's talk about that for a few moments here. We're not going to take the time to look at it, although maybe we should. Remember that after the flood, through Noah, then Shem, Ham, and Japheth, now you've got humanity populating the earth once again. Remember that? And they unite together to build a tower whose top may reach the heavens. Remember that? Did we, did we read earlier anything about some access point in heaven and some way from earth to heaven? How about that ladder? The Tower of Babel was Satan's attempt to usurp and create his own portal and access to heaven. Forget the ladder in, 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 in Genesis there. That's what the Tower of Babel is, uh, to go back and think about that. That when he creates that, that, that tower whose top may reach unto heaven, he wants to employ the angels with him to ascend and descend upon the earth. Forget God's word, forget God's angels, forget the rightful heir to the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, when, so you, have, you have just at that time just really one nation and one language and one people, remember that? So his building of the tower was in total, complete rejection of God's word. So he's weakening humanity. He's, he's seeking to have humanity become disloyal to the true and living creator of the earth. Well, at the Tower of Babel, then God comes and confounds the languages and he, spread, he, he forces them to spread abroad into peoples, the families, peoples, languages, nations. Remember that? That's Genesis 10. Remember that? And the Apostle Paul tells us over in Acts 17 that the purpose, the reason why... God, in fact, let's look at that. Look over to Acts 17. Look over to Acts 17. Watch this now. Look over to Acts 17. Look at Acts 17. Watch this. Think about this in relationship to... The event of the Tower of Babel and the, and the forcing of humanity to break up into families and, and uh, nations and peoples, things like that, and territories. So look at, think about this, if you would, in Acts 17, verse 26. Acts 17, 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men... For to dwell on all the face of the earth. See, Paul is speaking about a time, you go back to Adam, but then you go forward to when there are nations. So you're, so you're now, he's taking you past Genesis 12 and the dividing into nations, right? And he, he, it says, And it's made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. What's that mean, bounds, bound? That's boundaries, that's borders, those national borders. Okay, why did God do it that way? Look at the next verse, here's why. That they, that is the people, the people of those various nations, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and what? Find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Does God want to be found by mankind? Yes. Do people look for God or does God look for people? Yes. Isn't that interesting? God is, the, God is the one, the seeker, and 
you know, you, you, you look at Calvary and it causes you to take a second look, as it were. But you see a passage like that. God, when he on purpose forced the, 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 the breakup of the one united nation, Genesis 11, 10 and 11, when he forced that breakup, and they're forced to spread abroad, and they began to, to uh, group together in languages where they could communicate and so forth. They created borders, developed the cultures, societies. He did that on purpose so that they would seek the Lord and find him, though he's not far from every one of us. You see that there? So when you take a passage like that, and in the light of that, go back to Isaiah 14, Go back to Isaiah 14. Look at this. Back at Isaiah 14, 12. We're, unfortunately, we're not going to get a whole lot further than this right now this morning. But look at Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did what to the nations? Question. Why, what was God's intention of humanity after the flood, as it began to populate, what was God's intention of them forming nations? To find him. And if they would find him, righteousness exalts a nation. So in finding him, it would strengthen the nations. That verse says that this creature, he weakened the nations. How did he weaken them? By doing everything he could to prevent them from finding God, from main, to maintain their loyalty to him that really he got originally all the way back from the fall of Adam and Eve. Remember that? Not only that, if, if you look, uh, go backwards a little bit, look back at verse 4. Thou, uh, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how... How is the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in what? With the continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in what? Anger. Anger. See that? When it says that he weakened the nations, he hindered, he prevented them from, his goal was to prevent them from finding God. And the way he ruled over them was with cruelty and force and anger and power and punishment and so forth. Babylon is going to be called, it's going to become, it's going to be called the hammer of the whole earth. Have, has any of us here ever used that phrase, boy, this person was hammering that person? What do we mean by that? How many of y'all like hockey? And you say, man, my team got hammered. <laughs> okay. Yeah, think Anaheim Ducks. Anyway, so <laughs> right, sad to say. But, or you say, wow, our team hammered the other team. What Dominated, powerful, ruled over, or got crushed. When Babylon is said, how, when it's going to say about Babylon, how has the hammer of the whole earth been destroyed? That's what she's going to be. And you see in passages like this, that's how this person... In history, that's how this creature in history sought to maintain his control over the nations. Prevent them from finding God. Prevent them from finding the truth. And maintain his authority and power over them by crushing them. Think about Israel in Egypt. When, when, when the little remnant of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob first went down into Egypt. Remember Joseph was second in command? Jacob comes down and his brothers, the 70 souls in Egypt, that particular Pharaoh loved Joseph, loved Egypt, uh, loved the descent, uh, uh, Joseph's family and so forth. But boy, as soon as that Pharaoh died, and as soon as that Joseph and that generation all died, a new Pharaoh came into Egypt and that new Pharaoh absolutely persecuted Israel. You see what the pattern is happening there? And so here, this creature, he weakened the nations. Rather than allowing the nations find access to the true and living God, although God was right there at any point for any of them, he weakened them, crushed them with anger, ruled them with fear. And that's all finally going to be destroyed. So you can sense, therefore, when you look at verse 
uh, verse 6 again, He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted. The persecutor now gets persecuted righteously and justly, and none hindereth. Who do you, yeah, who do you think it's going to take to conquer this guy? It's going to take the Lord Jesus Christ himself to do that. And then look at the outcome once again, verse 7. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. Wow. Can you think of any place really on planet earth right now that, uh, that <laughs> where the earth is at rest and quiet? Say the grave. Scripture talks about the grave is where the servant is free from his master and where the oppressed are free from the oppressor. In all of human history, you, he you hear the cries of war on and on, the destruction. I mean, you, you just look at what's going on there, over there even now in the Middle East, and that thing's spreading. They're saying there's just no end in sight. And it's not going to be confined just to that part of the country. It's just on and on and on. They're still trying to figure out how to, main, how to keep the crazy thing in Russia and Ukraine going. What for? Have these people lost their mind? Shake your head, yes. And you understand spiritually why it's all happening. It has to do with, well, anyway. So what a great day when that verse, verse 7 says, the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. What a day lies ahead. Yes? Amen. When this rebellion will be utterly once and for all crushed. The whole earth will break forth into singing. The creatures waiting for, to be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Okay? Well, we're not going to get any further than this today. We'll pick up here next time. So... Uh, uh, let's unite our hearts in prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the insight and wisdom that your scripture gives us about really what, what's going on, in, not just in this world, but even in the unseen world among the angelic, with the angelic conflict, and how your scripture makes it very, very clear that regardless uh, of how bad and awful things can get here and have been on earth, that there absolutely is a resolution that... Uh, is going to happen, a resolution to your glory and honor. And just like the angels themselves are waiting for that, rejoicing in that, looking forward to that, we too can rejoice in the fact that by you making us members of the body of Christ freely, by grace, without cost, without obligation, all by the blood of Christ, that we too will be part of your family in the reconciliation of the heavenly places. Through Jesus Christ, we give thee praise and honor. Amen.